your main man comes at you with the first installment of status 10 characters and who else could be here as number one at number 10 but out of field and this man captain uh Groth what, what, what the fuck is your name there Grothnard 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 I'm trying to put Grognard I'm trying to give all kinds of stuff in here all together yeah but we got the captain here we got this 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 man you understand baby and today we're gonna be talking about the golden rule and let me throw in you, Alex. What is the golden rule in RPGs? Uh, to me, the golden rule is that there uh, is that all the rules are, are meant to be changed, and this really applies to to any game system you can think of. The rules are essentially meant to be uh, altered and, and homebrewed, or you know whatever whatever term you want to use, and uh, to to make to make the game suitable for you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the game is bad. It doesn't mean that anything is broken or flawed. It just means that, you know, you want to make the game suitable for, for what you want to do with it. When is the first time that you can remember in your RPG experience ever implementing the golden rule in your own gaming circles, whether it was implemented upon you or by you? Oh, well, that... Geez, we, we, as far as I know, we, we implemented it right when we first started playing. I started playing in high school, <clears throat> which was uh, about, uh, you know, 30-something <coughs> years ago. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it was, it was the, 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 really, the really old school system. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, just, we just homebrewed all the time. You know, we decided that, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted the characters to be able to do X, and so we made up a rule for it, and you throw the dice for it. That's it. And... Uh, it really doesn't matter if it's balanced. It, okay, I, I want to clear something up. I hate the, the idea of game balance. <laughs> I don't like game balance. I don't like the idea of it. It, it just... Uh, it, I like game fairness, I think, is a better way to look at it. If, 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 it, if, it's, if the game is fair, that's fine. But balance, to me, is, is kind of when you're, uh, you're... You're trying to get everything on an equal, an equal level. And that's not what life is like. Life is not an equal level. <laughs> you know, uh, there are people who are going to be better than you, people who are going to be worse, and life is like that. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, we made, we, made our, we made up our own rules all the time. I mean, that was just uh, how we played. Yeah, I think it's important what you're saying there about game balance. What you really need is game draw. There needs to be a reason to select choice X, Y, and Z. It doesn't have to be equal. They're different things as apples and oranges. Don't try to make a bard sing at a D6 damage. You know, you just give it something that makes people, makes somebody want to play it. You don't want to have something there that's so ludicrous that 90% of people choose it or so pathetic that almost no one picks it. You know, it's something it needs to, it needs to hit play regularly and incentivizing things that might be a little less likely to be played or decentivizing things that are more, more likely to be played, not, not building, you know, that's okay, a longsword's the best weapon, and here's like 90 feet for a longsword. It's like, well, no, how about some feats for a short sword? Because that weapon sucks, but people used it for real all the time. Why would they use it in this game? There, there needs to be some sort of reflection in that sort of area. But when you're talking about the golden rule, and that's what we're talking about here today, you out there, you viewers, and YouTube land, speaking to myself, speaking to Alex, members of the barbarian horde that will sweep down <laughs> upon you and cleave your head from your shoulders only to take your, your spoils and plunder for our, our own stronghold. So, when you're talking about the Golden Rule of Me, you're talking about the, the flame tender, the game master, the dungeon master, the individual that's keeping storytelling or otherwise refereeing the gaming experience to say, all right, look, we're going to throw this away and for what reason? For fun. To make the game more fun. To make the game more immersive. To make the game better. And overall, all those, again, are back to other ways of saying fun. Let's make the game more fun, more fluid, more flexible. Let's make it work best with our style. And from group A to group B, that what works best might be different. And that's okay, as long as you're taking the tools you have to produce the best product you can at your game table. That's really what should overall be the goal. And rules can get in your way so many times can trip you up can confuse you can be problematic to your group and i think that those are the rules that you just jumped away right at the bat when i first picked up D and D third edition i went uh not you have to confirm a natural 20 i said no that rule has got to go that rule has got to go that's not, not in my table it doesn't 
because uh, that's ridiculous. Cause it, yeah. it makes the game less fun. You're like, yes, a 20! Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Oh, it's not really a 20. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I've never seen a player like, yay, it wasn't a 20! It's like, it's not more suspense. It's, it, it just pisses players off. So I try to take a left turn on anything that pisses players off after 25 oh, and a half years of gaming. I said, you know, let's make people happy. Let's make people enjoy themselves, so not find well, things and the, that and, are, the thing, and the thing about changing the rules, though, is, is it doesn't have to be a permanent thing either. I mean, it, it can make sense for that particular situation. You know, the rule may say that your character has to do X, but you know what? You know, you're, you're, the, you're the DM, and you, can, and you can say, no, no, that, that makes no sense at all. You know, there's no reason that he should have to you know, take a five-foot step to do this or to, you know, um, to uh, uh, whatever whatever it happens to be. It, it, you know, there's, you know, you can throw out the rules, uh, you know, for, for one, uh, you know, for just one circumstance. It doesn't have to be. Now, there are some rules that I've changed just because um, uh, something made sense. And that's another reason besides fun, too. I mean, it, yeah, it's kind of like fun, but it, it's that if something just doesn't make sense to me. And like you, well, like you said, just you know, rolling the natural twenty and, and having it mean you know, almost nothing <laughs> unless you can <coughs> unless you can roll roll really well again. But uh, uh, oh, uh, for example, one of the, one of the, one of my uh, big homebrews is uh, hit points. Hmm. I ne I never liked the hit point system of uh, <clears throat> you know that that a that a twentieth level fighter can 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 fall can basically jump out of an airplane you know fall thirty thousand feet and survive. <laughs> you know, it, oh, yeah. it just made no sense to me whatsoever. So, so I came up with a, with a with my homebrew rules. This was before um, before Pathfinder, and where you know they, they they you take Constitution damage, and it just you know it just it just it can, you can anyone they everyone has basically on the same footing more or less. You know, it's it's the amount of physical damage you can take. So, um, it it just made a lot more sense to me. Same thing with with uh, being set on fire. You know, take one d four. to what? <laughs> You're on fire. <laughs> fire! <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know, that's just gonna like, oh, that stings. You know, and go on fighting. <laughs> You're gonna be on the floor rolling around. I don't know. If, I don't even know who's been on fire, but it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, seven, seven out of ten people are in fact on fire. So the uh, points right there clearly uh, makes. All the sense, anything that, any rule that either you just can't wrap your head around or you're pretty sure you're wrapping your head around it right, but it just ain't there. You got to you gotta figure out a way to make that better in there. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the two rules that vex players who examine them to an endless point or hit points in armor class, they're... Yeah. They're just horrible. They're just horribly done. <laughs> they were. They have like nineteen thousand editions of D and D. Yet they have never fixed hit points or armor class. They never even tried to. They just make them grow, grow further. <laughs> well, they, we we all know it doesn't work. But but let's add to it. <laughs> Three hundred hit points is surely the way to fix that problem. <laughs> you you think Congress was designing D and D or something? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think I might trust some of those guys with, with the product more than I do the people that are putting it together. To be honest, well, um, you know, every, everyone gets stuck in their own their own little paradigms, and they they, they don't want to change things. But um, yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, like you said, it's about fun. And if and if 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 something's not making sense to you, or if it's just not you're not enjoying yourself, or you know what, if you just want to, <laughs> you know, if you want to make it so that you know uh, paladins do. You know, can fly. Then make it, make it so they can fly. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever the hell you want. Sure. You know, as long as you have some degree of reason for flying paladins, sure. we could sit. <laughs> I, anyone who's sitting there's like paladins fly. That's stupid. But we, we could sit down and work that angle hard and come back to you tomorrow to a video. You'd be like, oh my god, why don't all paladins fly? You know, it's all about <laughs> the ecology, the yeah. meaning, the texture. It makes sense. And if, if yeah, flying exactly. paladins makes sense, all of a sudden everybody's going to be on that tip. So you know that, uh, of course, yeah. you know. And that's how you make things cool. You make them cool by having uh, having it make sense in the context of what you're doing. So that, that's that's very important. Well said. What are some of the uh, egregious uh, errors that you see in any 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 type of game that you would say, "Well, I need to home to golden rule that right away." Well. Well, as I mentioned, the, the the hit point thing, you know, really bothered me uh, for a long time, and and I, I just never did anything about changing it until <clears throat> yeah, I really started DMing regularly. I mean, 
because then I could, then I could. <laughs> um, but um, I'm trying to think of some of the other big ones that I'm, that have really changed. Uh, well, I, I've kind of muckied around with spells a little bit, uh, allowing players to, uh, uh, to you know, come, come up with some spell modification rules. I want to sort of get into an hex would be, you know, kind of kind of tough to describe on the on yeah yeah, yeah. but but basically so so that so the players could could get in there and, and and kind of tweak and modify their own spells to to suit their needs you know and and um because you know I, I always thought magic should be more fluid so that it uh, um so that a, a spellcaster can kind of get in there and 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 uh, you know make it make it unique make it their own and 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 make and it makes it part of their character it makes it. Uh, you know, part of who they are, and, and I, really, I like anything that will enhance, you know, the role play. You know, any anything that that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't uh, take away from role playing or adds to it. Um, so, you know, anything that you can uh, can give the character more uh, a more unique look or feel to them, or um, or make them feel that way. Yeah, we're definitely. Uh, it's clearly in agreement. Anything you can add to role playing and give you an extra hook or an extra way to present your character and extra aspects that are going to make the game more fun and giving you what to role play with is, is definitely clearly a good way to go about it. For me, when I'm, you know, when I'm looking at rules, you want know, to you want to break apart everything. And from having you know putting my own game together now, which which you know a lot about, is. Uh, very important to find out what facilitates in a game designer's mind the most fluid role-playing conscious aspect. I mean, if you want a role-playing game, if you want to push it to a little bit of role-playing, of course, there's lots of other ways you can do that with miniature style of games or board games esque role-playing games, but you know, for designing an actual role-playing game, for me, it's, it's about making things fluid, but that's something that I definitely bring up in within the Ring of Fire. The fact that, look, these are rules as I put them out. You might say, oh, well, this one and this one, we just got to get rid of them. Uh, do it. Don't get lo looped in because, see, the opposite of the golden rule is the rules lawyer. So let's talk about that monkey ass in a minute. The rules lawyer has the Bible. This is the rules as they're written. They will be enforced. They will be played. I, because they have to be, because he takes rule A, B, C, and then Q, F, and he takes like rule 28 over here. You're like, I didn't even alphabet, brother. No, no, no rule 28. And I got a ne I get the negative integer 7. So, uh, you know, they tie together things that, that don't make any sense because part of the big problem with like a system creep is designer designs, designer one designs the book, and then Two, three different people write splat books for it, and they don't know what the other person's done. They haven't read those books, and they don't know that tying these feats together in this horrendous way is going to make an optimized character, is going to make, you know, I've heard some things that are completely silly and broken out there, but, you know, the, the rules lawyer really, they don't want the golden rule. They want rules as written. The role, golden rule enforces fluidity of play. Because what you have to do as a player is respect your game master. If you don't, don't fucking play with them. Respect them. If they say it's this way, it's that way. And just let it go and, and say, okay, it was that way, so let's go with it and enjoy the game. But let's talk. What do you, what do you think about, about the, the opposite of all the people? <laughs> let's about it out. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing squashes, you know, an immersion <laughs> faster than a rules lawyer. I mean, they, they, they destroy it. And, and yeah. you know, it, it, it's, you know, they're, they're the ones who just, you know, uh, they, they suck the fun out of a game for everyone, you know, except maybe themselves. Now, now, I suppose maybe if you get a whole bunch of rules lawyers together and they all play, and they, you know, they all play together, then maybe, maybe they're okay. But <laughs> if, you, if, if you just can't mix, uh, you know, uh, role players with, with power gamers, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't usually work. Um, and and I, I kind of put uh, rules lawyers in with power gamers because that, that's, um, they 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 they're, they're kind of cousins, you know, <laughs> you know, because you you can't you can't be a power gamer without being a rules lawyer. <laughs> you know, you have to know. Well, let's say I need to maximize these things and and ultimate you know, ultimatize this or whatever. Um, but uh, but there's 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 always there's always ways to shut down a rules lawyer just by changing things up. You know, they they because they think they know what monster they're going to be fighting now. It's like oh that's a that's a troll, so I need to do I can do X Y and Z. It's like you think so. <laughs> Go ahead, give it a shot. Let's <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, and that, that to me isn't even a rules law. I mean, you're metagaming, and to me, metagaming is flat-out cheating. 
Yeah. You know, a rules lawyer wants to argue the mechanics of the rules. Uh, the power gamer wants to break them and optimize them. Not all power gamers are rules lawyers. Not all rules lawyers are power gamers, but a lot of them are. I would, I would say it's probably hitting up around the ninety plus percent mark. <laughs> but, uh, but the meta gamer is a whole. That's a whole different thing. That's uh, like, I played uh, every once in a while. I like to change it up in the live groups we have here and bring new people in. And we brought this couple in, and they, uh, the girl was okay, but the guy was just horrendous. They were they were there playing playing their characters. He goes, oh, well, and he, she starts talking to her while they're in there. And the combat for me is something you won't play through. Not yeah. something he's telling her out of character. Oh, I'm down uh, 18 hit points. Run over here and heal me. Game <laughs> stopped. I flipped out on him. Did and the players at my table are like, look at him like, you're about to get your ass whoop, boy. Because uh, that, that's cheating. You know, yeah. you know, you could just yell this. It's so easy to be, oh, I'm injured. Please help me. But, but, and talk about how, how, how your clavicle's broken and blood's pouring through your mouth or whatever. <laughs> right yeah. there, you've done exactly the same thing by role play. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, but, it, 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 <clears> but yeah, to, to, the, to the topic of the power gamers, they're uh, – Early epox. Every once in a while, I get someone in there. The, the video is trying to defend power gaming. I like mechanics. I, mean, I, I, I like hitting people with a bionic elbow, but that doesn't mean that's cool either. So, what about that? Um, but uh, you would you, you have that uh, aspect to it. You know, you really have um, people there that they just don't get it. I've seen games completely in game masters stop running games because of power gamers. They just yeah. come up, throw their hands up, and they go no. I'm not going to do it again. And I've seen it a few times, but I've, I've watched it. You know, I've heard so many stories about it. You know, I haven't I haven't played with people like that in, like, forever. So, you know, I'm not, not seeing it much. But when I see the groups I saw back when I was, like, a teenager, they had multiple power uh, – they had multiple uh, uh, rules lawyers in them. Uh, they didn't – they seemed to just hate each other. Like, they would – Always try to like cut each other off. Well, actually, subsection of rule three says that you can't do that. Oh yeah, well you don't know about rule eight from Dragon Magazine twenty nine. <laughs> yeah, idea. well, I was gonna say that's until they come up upon their common enemy, which is the role player, the one who wants to sit there and you know and, and read the love letter from their their lost one, and, you know. And that's like a waste of time. Them. Yeah, it's like, come on, we're supposed to get gold now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, people have completely missed the point. And quite frankly, I wish all those people would burn their books and get out of the hobby because they drive so many people away. You wouldn't yeah. believe it. Almost every single day I get a PM or letter from someone, God, I see your channel. This is what I thought role-playing was supposed to be when I started playing it 15 years ago. I stopped playing the hobby because all I saw was this, this, and this. Yeah. And uh, now I'm going to back. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it with these tips and ideas. And that's, you know, for me, I so I see those people as, not as loving brothers in arms, but as a vicious opponents inside that uh, that damage and destroy the hobby. So I have I have no regard or respect for them whatsoever. Um, but uh, let, let's talk about this so otherwise. In, in golden rules, what, uh, what what do you think about this idea? And I've heard this brought forward before in the community for people that like the three point X, three point oh, three point five versions of D and D, and even the Pathfinder. Talking about the Bill of Rights for players. Uh, which I don't think is a good idea. What do you think? Uh, <clears throat> the Bill of Rights for Players? I don't know. If okay, know. like, don't it seems to be, versus previous editions of Dungeons Dragons, from what some other uh, analysts of our hobby, which is, I guess, in a way where all of us are, mm -hmm. in, put forward saying that before it was what the game master said goes. And now in 3.5, under the clarity of the rules, you have players able to say no, the rules say this. You know, you have uh, things clearly built in, in a way that essentially allow you to sort of uh, have that, I, I guess, road to optimization. It's, it, it, it's a viewpoint that uh, I guess might be a little difficult for me to, uh, to even express as it's so unbelievably alien from my viewpoint. Me, it's like, as I'm a game master, I'm fucking Bane, son, and you will sit there and listen. You know, because it, it's about respect. If you're going to respect the game master, uh, I shut my mouth when other people are playing. I expect the same thing so that you can have, you know, those great scenes. That's what I play for, uh, whether I'm a game master or a player, having a great time. But uh, the, the, the ability to have a rule system to defend you, I guess. I don't think I'm making the point very well. I don't know. No, no I, I understand what you mean. Okay. Essentially, yeah, it, it, it's 
it, it's essentially uh, a system that creates rules lawyers, <laughs> where, where you know where the uh, you know, because if the player can override the DM with the rules, then then that that's really the opposite of the golden rule. Yeah. Because the whole point of the golden rule is to to move to advance the story, for everyone to have fun, and to you know essentially ignore the rules when 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 you feel like it, and 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 usually in in the case in in the uh, in the advancement of fun and or the story. So, <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't think it really matters. It, this 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 applies to a rules heavy or rules light system. I mean, um, I play. I I played in the game uh, uh, recently where, you know, we went through you know almost four hours of gaming, and we I I I, I tossed the dice twice. That was it. The rest the rest was just, you know, just role playing. And and this was Pathfinder, so you know it doesn't get much rules much more rules heavy than that. And so it, it's you know it, it's just the rules were just not pertinent to to what we were doing. So, um, and they could have been, you know, to someone who is, who is, uh, uh, you know, more, more tied to the rules. They, they they might, you know, decide, oh, well, you have to roll for this, 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 and this, and uh, it's it's just not necessary. It, it it slows the flow. So you can you can do this with with really, uh, you can use the golden rule with any system. You know, it really doesn't matter. Now some 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 are kind of built for it. You know, um, I'm trying to think of a, a good example of a of a really rules light system. Um, can you think of one that's like just ex extremely rules light? Uh, well, uh, I don't know how rules light. <clears throat> obviously, Savage World is pretty rules light. Uh, World of yeah. Darkness is pretty rules light. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. Do you want something even further rules light <laughs> than that? No, no. I mean, that that that, that those are good examples. Okay. And, and, uh, so you, you know, there's there's a lot less uh, golden uh, golden ruling you need to do in that in that kind of in that kind of system. Uh, the more rules you have, obviously, the more you need uh, the more you need to do it. You know, to to keep things flowing. Um, but you can't be afraid to do it. You just you, you know, as long as the story and the role playing is is the focus, um, you know, it, it, it's 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 going to work for you. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. I think that that's something that's very important for any young game master out there. Don't be afraid to try it, to, to, to change things around a little bit. I wouldn't say the very first time you ever run a game, if it's the first game you've ever run, you might want to just stay and do things as they are to give yourself a, a kind of foundation because an important thing about changing rules, you got to remember, it's like Jenga. Rules interlock in ways that you're not necessarily going to understand or expect when you first start playing a game. However, once you kind of have an idea of overall the way the rules mesh together, you can go, okay, well, this one I really don't like. Or this one, you know, needs to be changed. Or, you know, let's do something different over here. Um, you know, it's like, you know, if you yank a lineman out of D&D, &D, you need to remember you're going to have to make some modifications to classes. You're going to have to make some modifications to spells. You're going to have to change things around a little bit. And I can give you a lot of other examples there. But overall, don't be afraid, you know. After you think you, this is my advice, after you think you know the system pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well, don't be afraid to change things, to challenge things, to keep pushing forward, because that's how you're really going to get better as a game master in terms of, of, of developing your own styles. And I say style, it's not style, because you know if you just run one way all the time, that can get very boring, regardless of how awesome it is. But when you could flip it up, when you could do X, Y, and Z, you know, it, it keeps the players off, off balance and off pace, so they, they're going to have a lot more fun. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a very important point that you brought up there, Alex. Well, if you think about it, there's really two, there's really two kind of sets of, of golden rules. You, you, you have the, the, the big permanent changes, which is what I think you were talking about there, where, you know, if, if, if you're revamping the, the, the hit point system and, and you're changing alignments, you're doing all the big... You know, because that, then it's like going into your house and like removing major support walls. You know, that's yeah. that's a, that's that's very different. Versus you got to paint a room a different color, or <laughs> you know, uh, so if if you're just changing some aesthetics, mm -hmm. or if you're, or if you're just doing something temporary, like you know, and again using the same analogy, moving a chair around. You know, uh, if some you know some some guy wants to jump across a ravine, and you decide to wing it, you know, based on the circumstances, that's not going to break the game. You know, it, it, it's it's when you're doing the big permanent changes. Those those you're right. You want to hold off on, but this but but uh, I think the, the especially the new DMs need to be able to remember to just go in and and 
if something just doesn't make sense to you, then then just you know tell the player that tell the player that this happens and it works. You know whatever you you know if, if it makes sense. Um, yeah, you know, just just wing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really I I have a pretty big disdain for back of the book buried sort of rules rules that are in you know all these random editions. It's like oh well here's the exact rule for drowning and here's the rule for um, you know, dying of heat exhaustion and so forth, and buried some bizarre places. Like, you know, rules like that should be very easy to do. They should, yeah. not saying that you don't necessarily want to have a role for drowning <laughs> or a role for uh, heat exhaustion, but, you know, they, they should be intuitive, work the same way other roles do. Often roles like that are, are bizarre, they're clunky, they don't make any sense. It's like, oh, we'll roll every nine minutes, if, you know, and you have to get a seven, <laughs> if you don't get a seven, then you lose one point of, of uh, uh, you know, Constitution. It's like, oh, come on, dude. Let's, let's make this a lot more fluid, and let's let's minimize the rolling. And you know, if you're in a situation where you're going to get dehydrated and die, like you, you can't really roll your way out of that. You're just you're just eventually going to die. You know, <laughs> you, you probably should have brought a water skin. Um, you know, because there's just no way around that. But you know, I think that to me, to me, when I look at a system, the, the first thing I want to look at is, is to get the fluidity to make make sure the game runs. Uh, but yeah, like you're saying, you know, it definitely is a big difference between ripping out enormous portions of a game like hit points or armor class or alignment versus just taking taking something small like uh, maybe saying even in like a customization levels like saying okay, well we're going to change a uh, bard to work work like this. We're going to swap these skills out because this skill doesn't make any sense to me. I think the skill makes more sense on a class skill basis, something like that. But but yeah, I mean those those definitely I think are the better places for a new player to start. If you're like a thirteenth time you play D and D, don't try to rewrite hit points and armor class because you're probably gonna like fuck your game up really bad. Um, but uh, if if you you want to start working towards that, begin begin at the bottom like like I was just saying. You know, start with maybe modifying one defeat, and then you can see where you where you succeeded and where you failed, and have players engage in open dialogue with you. And say, okay, I think that was too overpowered. This is too underpowered. This this is uh, I don't like how you did that. And you're going to have to be tough enough skin to hear. I don't like how you did that. That that screwed the game up. And then you go, okay, well, well, how do you think it would have be been better? And then you can have it back and forth. Having open dialogue with players is is uh, oh, yeah. well. That, that has to be trust and respect going both ways. I mean, Absolutely. you know the. the you know, you need to trust the DM. Where if he says something happens, it happened. You know, you don't know everything that's going on. You, you don't know why it happened, uh, but it happened. So you, you know, say, "Well, that sucks," and you move on. <laughs> you know, I just lost my arm. Oh well. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. That that, that can happen. You, know, you can get really uh, uh, in a lot of trouble. You know, I've run. I like to use diceless combat from time to time in any game I'm running. It doesn't matter what system it is to to change things up and have a different style, a different pace. And I've I've had characters in Vampire that I've beaten into Torpor in a, in a scene like that. And I've had characters that I've killed in games without a single dice being rolled. And you know my players they trust me. They they know that I understand the mechanics. And when you're running a dice, you got to make sure you understand what the characters can of doing. You need to know what their strength and dex is. You need to know what their skills are so you can adequately you know run that around. You know for me it's it's kind of like having the the, the mind in my head, then you let them have some narrative and then you, you kind of plug all the information in mm -hmm. and it's like, boom, this is what happened. So it's what happened in my head. We're running with that. So, you know, I think you really have I to think, trust me. I was going to say, I remember watching uh, one, of, one of your videos where uh, uh, I think you're, you're, you're playing Vampire the Masquerade and, and uh, uh, one of the characters kind of leaned out the window and, and gave someone the finger and the, and, the, and the DM just, you know, he, he says, you know, your finger gets shot off. No roll, nothing else. It was just, Bam! You know, you think you get shot by by a random by, by a random stray shot. It's like that was that was beautiful because both the you know the the, the DM thought on his feet, didn't bother rolling, and, and and the player was cool with it. And and to me, that's that's just that's perfect. You know, that was really really nice how that you know how that went. You know, I remember seeing. That, I said, like, oh, that's that's that, that's the kind of game I, I like. <laughs> you know, we just you know everyone is just okay with with what happens. And and it, it, because it because it was really it was a really it was a really cool moment in the story, and, and it was the story that was important, not you know oh how am I gonna you know what's gonna happen to my dex checks and you know oh yeah that stuff you know <laughs> it's just like oh that was awesome <laughs> yeah absolutely and in uh, any game you know you want to play to make the scene cool that's what you can take away that's what you got to remember uh, players out there you could take 
the scenes away. Those are your memories of the game. It's not how many D8s did you roll or how much how much gold did you get or what did you get that plus 19 sort of holy bootiness. You know, that you don't care about that stuff, man. It's those scenes where everyone else is like, man, your character was awesome. Remember uh, with when other players bring it up, man, remember when you did this, this, and this in the game? I'm like, yes, I did. What were you playing that game? I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember either. Uh, what, was your, what was your dexterity of that character? Uh, you know, you know no, no, one's gonna remember that. no one's going to remember that stuff. And well, one thing, one thing to 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 uh, to new DMs too is that you don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel too, because there's there's so many um, experienced dungeon masters out there, or game masters that if if there if there's a a homebrew rule, it's it's probably already been done. So so you can try and find people and, and find these rules that that already exist. Um, some some games even offer offer you know. Uh, variants they design. I know Pathfinder does that, where they have, uh, um, you know, the, the the hit point rule that I had kind of come up with, you know, my on my own. They 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 made into they built into their uh, uh, as a variant. <clears throat> so you can you can you can often find these things already in existence. If you don't like a, a rule system, do a Google search. You know, if you don't if you don't like uh, how the hit points work, do a Google search. You probably find something where someone who is experienced already did it. And they'll and they'll lay out you know how you can do it and you know so you can take shortcuts. Yeah, absolutely. Is a ton of great resources out there. I know the power gamers are out there hitting up every website they could find to find out where is that optimal bill, where's that feet tree, <laughs> where's that bill. I never heard of this before. I started getting involved into the YouTube RPG Brigade. Uh, I never heard about this stuff. Like, I thought this was a joke. Like the first time anyone had ever mentioned that to me. I was like, that that's not real. Nobody posts the optimal bills of characters <laughs> online and, and if they did, certainly nobody would ever look at that. They'd keep moving on. And, I mean, cause that, to me that's it's it's the complete opposite of the way I would think of a character. For me, I want my character to be unique and different and cool. I don't want anyone else to ever play my character. And I certainly God I don't want to play a character that dozens, if not hundreds of goofs have played. I mean well, that doesn't make any sense at all in my mind. You know, you're you're working completely against what, what, what you want to do there. Oh yeah, I, I remember that uh, there, there was one version of D and D where they came out with uh, some NPC classes. Maybe it was in Dragon Magazine or something. But they had one. I think it was called the uh, the Scholar or something like that. Uh, 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 and and basically, all he did was just he just gained knowledge. He he had no no real hit points to speak of. He had no uh, no fighting ability. But it's like, oh, that that would be so cool. I want to play that character because. You know, he, he just sounds really interesting to play. And it, it, it's just the, the opposite of what a power game would do. I, see, I, I wanted to play him because of the the uh, the role-playing possibilities, not because, you know, he can do this much damage and he can, you know, throw these spells or whatever. Yeah, I think a sage is a great concept for a character. I, I really uh, I really like a sage idea because, you know, you could just sit there and just drop mad knowledge on people. You know, and uh, it, it characters like that – only work in well done games where your game master knows their world. You ha the game master has to know their history. Yeah. The game masters, a lot of players have dim view of knowledge skills because they play games where knowledge skills don't matter because the game master doesn't know their world. If the game master knows their world, oh, God is history an important skill. I mean, that, that shit can get your ass saved. You're like, actually, I know the, the, the guys of the Southern Plains are uh, extremely vengeful people. I don't think we should be desecrating that burial side yet. <laughs> Um, you know, the barbarians over there, like, just carving his name on it. You're like, oh, well, uh, glad you know how to sign your name. I'm going to leave, and uh, you could be killed. You know, just as a, just a kick off the, off the minds that commentary on that. So, you know, a skill like history, for example. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, no knowledge is power. And, and yeah. um, <clears throat> whether whether it's, you know, like you said, knowledge of history or even just, you know, local knowledge, knowledge of nature. I mean, any of those any of those knowledge skills can be can be – you know, vital when 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 you're doing anything. You know, it's, it's, it's I, I I love knowledge based skills. I, I always I always kind of you know I always make sure I have <laughs> I, I, I have something in those because they're always valuable. Especially and again that they're they're not really power gamer skills because they're almost always uh, useful in role playing, not killing. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, you're not going to be killing stuff with uh, with your knowledge necessarily. Well, actually, you will, but they don't see it that way. You still there?
Hello? Oh, Hello there, there, you there? there yeah. you go. Okay, yeah, we're still on. Uh, the broadcast running. We had some kind of there, so. problem there. So, Alex, please continue your point. You broke up somewhere in the middle of what you're talking about. Uh, okay. It's uh, still running. <laughs> it looks like it is. It looks like, yeah, it looks like it's still on there. Google Plus. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, don't remember where, where it was when it dropped out. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, let's um, you know, talk, talk about the... Uh, the golden rule here and how we see that as an application to let's look at let's talk about like how we can uh, explain to a new game why don't you take this how do you explain to someone who's their very first time with a role playing game how they should implement the golden rule in their in their group with their new players as they're working towards building that trust uh, that, that we've been talking about okay uh <clears throat> Well, certainly, I mean, the, using the golden rule for 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 just you know everyday mundane stuff is 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 important. Um, you know, if if you've got someone who can track um, and and they're following some, some you know and they're trying to and they're trying to track something and it's and it, and it's pretty clear that it's that it's an easy track or or, or even if it's something that doesn't necessarily isn't critical to the uh, to the story, like if he's just tracking a deer for for their for their evening dinner or something, um, you, ju you you just let him do it. You know, you, you you say, okay, you succeed. You find you you know you find the deer, whatever. You, you just you just let it happen because it, it's it's not critical to to the story. You know, it's not critical. Now, if he's if he's chasing a bad guy and it's and the bad guy may or may not get away, and you know, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> Your idea Thank is you. so good. The uh, Google Plus gave you applause on that one. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week. Yeah. Um, you know, so just you know, just things like that. You know, if if someone's just trying to jump across a five foot you know ditch, they jump across a five foot ditch. You know, um, and that'll lead and that'll lead into other stuff. Once that once they once your players see, especially that you're not going to abuse it, <laughs> that you're not going to be, you know. Um, Throwing throwing all this all this negative stuff at him, and, the, and that you're not just going to kill him because you had the whim to, or you know, a big meteor falls out of the sky and hits you in the head. Sorry, no. <laughs> you know, ra random stuff. Um, it, it, it's 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 the golden rule. Of is really called the common sense rule. You know, if it, it, just use it as um, if it makes sense that something can work, it works. And and especially if it's not something that's critical to to the story or or your uh, your plot. Yeah, I completely agree with you in terms of making that very clear. And you know, when writing a little far, I, I made sure to keep in mind that it's not just for immersive gamers, it's for people that want to make that journey towards immersive, want to make that journey towards being the best gamer they can. And very clearly writing the rules in a way they almost can't be rules lawyered by saying you know, by continually qualifying things under the idea of, of the golden rule, under the idea of, of it's your game. You've bought it, the game master, the flint, and you And you, uh, actually, that's a, a passage right in the, the skills section, something along those lines to say, you know, if you're someone with like 10 grades of stealth and you're, uh, you know, a, a peasant watching, you know, peasants are standing over there. Don't roll for that, dude. You just sneak by. You're like, you ninja past them. It's not, like, if you watch the movie and somebody's like this ninja <laughs> master, master of the uh, and just like some just random uh, fishmonger, like, just saw them, like, while they were trying to do that stuff. Like, Come on, dude. How am I going to put your character over and believe in you anymore? No, just, you do it. And just like, they're, you know. You know, let him narrate that. Let him let him take control. Yeah. Keep charge of it. You know. Well, the other thing you do too is 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 it is the DM can encourage their players to 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 take it to do that sort of thing too. Absolutely. Um, to to think creatively outside the box. I mean, uh, especially with especially nowadays with with uh, um, like you know you 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 and I you and I probably learned to to play these games before video games came along. At least you know uh, anything more advanced than Pong, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, a lot of the kids now they're 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 learning video games first, so they're 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 more accustomed to you know your character can do this and only this, you know he can jump, you know up the only this high or he can only pick up this rock or whatever it happens to be. Um, 
get get the players to really think about the the, the idea that they can do anything. They can do anything that they can think of, you know, within within the rules of you know within not the rules within the within the bounds of common sense. You know, um, if they come up with a creative idea to to get across that chasm that's not in the rules, you know, you, you either you either homebrew rules do it or you just let them do it or you. Or you don't let them do it and they fall, or you know, whatever makes more sense. But you 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 encourage them to be creative about about how they're going to play their character, because that's going to make immersive role players rather than rules lawyers. You know, because then they're not going to be. It's like because if, if if they if they know that they have to look up a rule for every little thing they do, then that then that's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to learn. If if you teach them that, you know what? If if uh, if my character wants to pole vault, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are no pole vault rules in any of the systems that I know of, anyway. <laughs> if I want to pole Actually, vault, Google or... H, uh, Q, and Dragon Magazine 47, there's a, a complete <laughs> chapter of pole vaulting. <laughs> the complete guide to pole vaulting, I think it's called. <laughs> so, so if they, if they want to pole vault, um, you know, then then you know you just you forget you you either come up with a rule that you know I do a dex check, you know whatever you want to do, yeah. uh, or you just let them do it if it's simple. So, if if you if you encourage your players to do it, they'll understand when you do it, and and you'll all be on the same page. And and also be, just being open and talking to them about it, ex let them know what your expectations are and what your um, and hear what theirs are, and make sure you're all on the same page too. Because if you're if you're not on the same page, then well, <laughs> then it's time to get probably to get a new gaming group together. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think well. you're absolutely right about that. I think it's very important. To, to get the players there and to, to earn that trust to show them uh, something that I, I find very very important for people to, to understand you know when I'm running a group it is nothing I don't show any degree of favoritism based around you know if I know this person for a thousand years or if I just met you today there's none of that you know it's just bring it make make it you know present your ideas in a way that that I can I can get with you that's it like if I can if I can go yeah all right. <clears throat> And then that's it. That's all you need. It's like, oh, okay, no, I, I can buy that. Or it's like, come on now, <laughs> oh, son. You know, and people are like, you know, you have people that have some kind of whacked out ideas, and you're like, what? You know, <laughs> you no, know, I'm not just going to let you just do that. that you know, that, that's that's a little a little over the top. But then other people that 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 are scared, you know. But I think a lot of rules lawyers come about because they've been abused by game masters. It's usually a rules. Most rules lawyers are the product. <laughs> Of abusive types of game masters, you know the slaughterhouse GM, the uh, you know is, is one type of guy that just kills characters, kills characters. And he thinks, ah, I've been playing, I've been running the game for eight hundred and nineteen years. What do you think you know, my main man? And I'm like, you shut your mouth because you've been doing it for eight hundred and twenty years the wrong way, you mealy mouth little maggot. So listen up and and hear what your main man has to say. And I think that it's so important to remember that you know you can get involved with it and, and really get the players uh, to believe in you. Or you can you can have the players where where, where they don't, where, where they're where they're afraid, where they're like, well I have to have something to protect me. I need a player's bill of rights. I gotta have <laughs> something so I don't just get off like that. Because okay. it doesn't matter, I don't know damn player bill of rights. If a game master wants to get that ass, he's gonna get that ass. He has to be a complete inept boob not to be able to kill your character. Because you know what I have? Armies of wizards with fireballs and fireballs and lightning bolts. You know, it, it's you have all that disposal, so you can't beat beat the game master, nor should the game master no. be trying to beat you. You're no. working together. But that, that that that's another good point too, and, and I don't know if it, I don't know if it necessarily has to do with the golden rule, but you know, new DMs don't be afraid to kill your characters. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Um you know, I, I, I've been in games where, where the DM just just wouldn't kill you, and and I and I tested it, you know, because like oh, yeah. I, I began to suspect that I couldn't die, and then and, and then I just did something really stupid deliberately to see if I could die, and I didn't. So <laughs> it's like, gee, I would have killed me, <laughs> you know, because that because that's so funny either, you know. But yeah, it's it's make sure you kill your, you know, you're not afraid to kill your characters. Don't go out of your way to kill them, but don't be afraid to kill them. Yeah, especially like if it's climactic, if it's cool, if the player could take something oh, yeah. away from it. Like, 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 oh, I was badass, you know. And, and then have your players will, will kind of surrender to you. Like, okay, well, 
yeah, that really made a hell of a scene for me to have the character die. And like, I, I, I give the player, like, if you're going to die, I'm going to give you everything. I might let you have an extra dying swing. I might, you know, let, let you say some, uh, some extra Last words. words although, yeah. although you're technically dead. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm try to let you paint that scene because, like, you're going out. Like, for me, when I'm watching a movie, I'm damn near fine with the, the, the protagonist doing anything if in the end they die. Like, if you know, if you, if you killed, like, the whole alien invasion by yourself, but you ended up getting killed, you had to pay that price. Okay, that that's all right. But when you walk away from it all, like, ha, 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 you know, I'm Kevin Zorbo yeah. was like, oh, you smell like Kevin Zorbo. What's wrong with you? You know, that's nobody trying to get that Xeno Warrior Priestess action in here. You know, that's uh, what you don't want. So, you know, for me, that that's that, that's a big thing. Yeah, because again, it, it uh, again, it's a matter of trust. I mean, it, you know, they, they they have to be they have to trust that you're not going to kill them, um, you know, wantonly, but they also have to trust that you're not going to, you know, do, you know, keep them alive when they really shouldn't be. Because again, for, anyway, for me, that 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 destroys the fun. You know, that that means that means that there's no risk involved at all, <clears throat> and and that just that's just not any fun. Absolutely. Um, I thought, by the way, I thought I thought of I thought of a couple more things that I that I uh, remember that I that I tend to uh, sure. that I homebrew. Um, one of them, which was brought up by this subject, is resurrection. And, and raise dead. I I, I found in, in games that I played that it was way too easy to get, and it, and it was way too easy to have, and there was no co there was no real cost involved. And to me, there should be a big, huge, gigantic cost in raising someone from the dead. <laughs> you know, otherwise, to me, it's just it, you know, one of my pet peeves is anything that makes it feel like a video game. I I I, I, I have a prejudice against that. So it, it, it's. You know, if, if you can just, you know, well, let's get him to the temple, raise him again, you know, <laughs> put down your gold, and poof, he's back. You know, how is that any different than World of Warcraft, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely pitiful. Yeah, you know, it, it's like, I'm not opposed to raising from the dead. I'm not, you know, I think I think it can be used, but there's got to be a cost to it somehow. There's got to be a quest involved. There's got to be, you know, whoever's raising you has to pay a price, you know. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe they almost die in the attempt, or do die in the attempt if they if they fail. You know, something that that makes it hazardous to do so. Because otherwise, your heroic death you just had is meaningless. <laughs> you know, like you said, the guy. You know, it's it, this is this is kind of, this is kind of like those action movies. You know, the guy. You think the guy dies, and then he shows up at the end. It's like, oh, he didn't really die. Yeah, it kind of spoils it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a quick aside of the conversation when you're talking about that. And, and all you want to know about how to raise dead correctly, check out your main man's video. It's titled Raise Dead or Resurrection or something like that. Just put what WWE did it. <laughs> and, and, and we go through it. I, I completely agree with what he says there. In a fantasy game, I like to have it as a possibility. But for me, it's a possibility to build a story with, not something that you're necessarily going to get. It's something that... If it happens, it might happen once in the campaign. But more likely, you're going to go there and try to get it done, and be like, "Ooh!" And they just into the street with you. Because guess what? Uh, guess who's not going to get resurrected? People that aren't down with that god. That that is something you are directly with a god. The god's like, "Oh hell no, we ain't bring that back." Mm -hmm, honey, no, we won't. But for me, it can put in great moral quandaries, right? All right, so I run this game with uh, with two 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 players, and they. This long bond, they're, they're great friends. One of them gets killed. His character gets killed. And the other one keeps trying to go to all the, you know, places he should to try to like, get this one or that one. This is before I was, I, was, I was more lenient then. At the time I'm describing, I was more lenient towards what I would allow in terms of resurrection than I would be now by a lot. And he's going to him. And, uh, you know, he's getting turned away and turned away and turned away and turned away. And all these, these faces are friendly with her. Like, well, we're not going to bring this guy back. And you know, we've augured the spirits that, that act as emissaries from, from our divinity. And the answer is no, we won't. This person is best. They'd be remained dead. What's wrong with you, you know? Um, and finally makes a quest out there. So he has to come up to something else that, that isn't, isn't to, to him as like almost the antithesis of where he wants to be. He's like an undead hunter. And he ends up having to go to this guy that kind of makes the other character come back sort of as a, in a quasi-undead sort of state. That's the only way you eventually find it. And it completely changes this whole character's paradigm. Because it's like, well, well, hell, this, this, you actually were willing to help us in a way. And, and so forth. I know, you know, I brought the, the actual god came in and was in the scene. And they, the god talked to him. He was in, you know, another dimension. 
Uh, and, uh, it, it produced a really fantastic scene with some great dynamic character aspect. It brought him into all this quandaries of faith, and the other character comes back in this new state. So we, it hit the ground running with some amazing role playing. And of course, the resurrection scene itself should be tremendously well described. Talk about what happens in the land of the dead. <laughs> Talk about all this thing. But I'm not going to go into that because I've already done a video on it. But but wonderful points there, Alex. I like that you you know you brought that up. Yeah, yeah. Re Resurrection is a big one. Teleport is another one that I think is, is a little oh. overused. Um, <clears throat> you know, because again, it's it's a little video gamey for me. So I, I kind of like, you know, I, again, I think it should be used. But you know, I, I'm a, I'm a lot more strict about how well you know a place, and and if you screw up, you know, there's there there are more there are harsher <laughs> um, consequences if you if you fail. Because you know, you're 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 teleporting yourself through another dimension to to appear someplace. You don't know what's going to be there. You don't know if it is if the place is going to be there. It's just you know, and if and if you don't know that that place down to the last speck of dust, you know, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to do. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I have some special rules for for teleporting too. <laughs> yeah, I think that's another one a great one to talk to new players about teleport and anything movement. Your biggest problems. It's not damage, not armor class, and all that. It's movement. Movement is the quickest thing that will destroy your game. Being able to, to move, to go into other dimensions, any of those things. Because here's the, here's the big problem you run into. You go, okay, and I've seen new game masters give it because they, they let they let players take everything and players just rape them and walk away with these like rings of teleportation. You go, oh, it just lets them teleport. And they're not thinking about the fact that this player has a background. He's been to other places before the game starts. And all of a sudden he goes, well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back to this place. To, to where? Uh, and the game master, horrified, deer in the headlights, knows he's no idea what that place looks like, what it feels like, who's there. No information. The guy's just jumped onto a blank canvas, and he is expected or required to, to run this. And it just rapes him of energy. It just rips it out of his mind. Like, you see his pattern bleeding and damage. Like, ah, 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 ah. You know, it's just a terrible thing. And yeah. you know, it's a really unfortunate deal when uh, you don't ever let, if you're a new game master, don't ever let anyone have the teleporting stuff. Uh, because they could just jump to anywhere, and it can it can make things too easy. It can get them out of places. It can force you to run. You can have all this stuff planned out, and then they jump to the furthest part of the world away, or they've jumped to another dimension, and you're not you're not ready for it. You know, and that that can that can destroy your game experience and just cause you to go, well, we can't play anymore. And that's the absolute worst thing as a player you can do your game master, making them go, well, pushing them beyond their limits. You know. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and at the very least, you can you can give the stuff a really high cost, whether it's a whether it's a physical cost, meaning it co you know to teleport maybe takes you know a huge amount of, of, of wealth to actually do it, some sort of exotic items, um, or you make it real risky, and and you know unless you know a place inside and out, you know there, there's there's going to be risk, and even then you know there's a there's a small chance that uh, <laughs> that you that you could end up uh, you know fifty feet off the ground. <laughs> yeah. In D&D, I think it's something that they give you too easily in magic items and so forth, and they give it to you too quickly. I, I think it can be there. I mean, I use it, and it will be within a ring of fire, but it won't be as easily accessible. It won't be uh, the ability to break games. And all all the times, and I don't want to give spoilers out, but all the times it, it connects to something. It connects towards something you're going to to give it like a really a really lush way that you can, you know, you, you can go through this thing into that thing. Uh, you know, you kind of can make it a lot easier for people to get with it. Oh, okay, that's cool. That makes sense. I, I understand that, and it gives it you know, uh, more of a feel towards the spell. And, and that, actually, that's another good point too. Is is uh, for DMs, don't be afraid to homebrew spells and magic items because uh, you know just just come up. Even if you don't have the rules for a spell, come up with the idea for the spell, and 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 you can, and you can you can work up details later or. Um, come up with a magic item that, that 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 they have never heard of, because especially if you, if you happen to have people, you know, players who have, you know, or you know, rules lawyers who've like, you know, sifted through the book and they think they know all the magic items and what they do. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they don't. Um, and and it doesn't all have to be powerful, you know, like staffs of the magi and you know things that are going to unbalance your game. You know, they, they you can you can you can have a bowl that just you know fills with prunes every other day. You know, it doesn't have to be this huge exotic you know game changer. It can be you know, small mundane magic items that are that are cool for uh, for, to, for the mood of the of the place, but they're um, but they're not necessarily gonna you know flip the game. I have a great out, story you know. about that. And in the same game I was telling you about with the resurrection, the one one of the players 
And uh, in fact, it's the same player that you guys have seen in most of the fire videos, Nugulus, Nosaurus, Ken. Uh, he was playing a character named Urkor, and they they end up scalping the, this this uh, powerful spiritual creature, and he, he scalps it and takes his hair. He's talking about how how you know his hair is so like uh, uh, luxurious, and he ends up taking and making a magic item out. So I, uh, we call it the wig of luxuriousness. And what what it had is what he what he 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 marked out for this like nothing else. It gave him a minus ten penalty to disguise checks. <laughs> He, so even if you're in, because he had like a spell that could like, I think changes, you know, one of those lower spells lets you like change his face or something because he was like a wizard. And I said, well, even in that form, it doesn't matter. They're going to recognize you. They're going to see uh, the, 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 the supreme uh, beauty and regal and splendor of, of your form with this hair. And I would always describe it like it was this like Fabio hair. And uh, it was funny because this character was like, like this ugly monster asleep, but now he had this wonderful hair. And the hair would always like, it would look like a fan was always blowing on it. And it would just like, and all the women would always stop and look at him. But the, the thing he loved, and he loved this, the fact that it, the justification, the reason behind the fact that it gave him a minus 10 to the Scott's penalty, because it was, it was such a signature style, such a signature item, an idea that uh, it, it literally prevented anyone. And it gave him other bonuses too. But it you know, the bonuses it gave him from a min master standpoint, you'd be like, I think I might have tended to skies for like a plus two to diplomacy and you know, a, a plus one to, to this. You know, it was it was very little, but it was just it was the fact of how how, you know, it would just flow and the way it would look and, and he, I mean, he he adored the item. Um and it was this wig that he like, you know, was, was like grafted onto his head. But uh yeah, that that was just a different example of exactly what you're talking about. An item that it's not going to give you a bonus to hit or damage or teleport you, but can can be you know something that's remembered for for a long time. Oh yeah, and 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 that and that and that seems you know and you can just you know you can just wing this stuff as a DM. I mean you know um, you know if if you come up with, even with randomly generated treasure, you know if they, they they might find a cup or something like that, and and you can just come up with an idea. You don't even have to do it on the spot because it'll be a while before they figure out what it does. So so you can you know. Later on down the line, you, they they find that this cup, you know, does X, whatever X happens to be. Um, I think I think it was in the uh, uh, the Stephen King Dark Tower series. Uh, the the main character he had what, what what he called a grow bag, which I thought was a really cool magic item because it it uh, it would just kind of it would just kind of grow items in it over time, you know, and not a lot, you know. He might find like uh, a handful of coins in there one time or. Or tobacco for his uh, for his cigarettes, or you know, he find he just you know find stuff over time, and uh, I thought what a, what a cool magic item to put in a campaign because as a as a, as a DM you could you could put anything in there, <laughs> you know, he could come up with uh, all kinds of all kinds of weird stuff that, that that just grows in it when you're not paying attention. So yeah. I mean, it, it you know just being creative with uh, with it and. Uh, you know, and like you said, those are the things you got to remember. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna remember the plus one sword that that was just a plus one sword. You're gonna remember the uh, the sword of Athelial that you know was uh, came from this great battle, and uh, oh, and it it it, gl it glows it glows green, you know, and it, it, it's the little details that you're gonna that are gonna make your character. I mean, you could be that simple. It could just be a plus one sword, and also it can glow green. You'd be like, oh, we, we, oh we, our, our torches are out. Oh, my sword can glow green. And you're like, oh, because you put them in that, in that spot to get that spotlight, and they all remember that, that, <clears> that, that sword would glow green for them. And, you know, it means something. They have that backstory. You know, I, I like to do that with items. I make them very personal and mean something to the character because I hate the I hate sh magic item shed, which I think something that kills them. Very well. you, you don't see... Yeah. You know, characters in like mythology, like they get like a magic item and then they throw it away and get a better one and a better one and a better one. And every three game session, they get a better one. You know, you'd be like, well, was there item again? I don't even care about this. You know, they get that item and then that item is like, this is the deal right here. And it has that backstory, it has a name, it has all that. And I think all that's just so incredibly important. You know, yeah, it, it's funny. For, for, a while I did, for a while, I did play World of Warcraft. Uh, uh, a friend of mine got me into it for a bit. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the whole point of that game is is uh, to um, to get your character up to the maximum level you possibly can with the most power and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and uh, but I ended up getting this sword that just looked really cool, and it, it was it was a really weak sword, but 
you know, people, people, you know, people always ask me. It's like, why, why do you have that that weak, weak ass sword? It's like, look how cool it looks. <laughs> and I, and that's why I kept it because it just looks cool. I I, I couldn't couldn't damage for crap, but <laughs> it, it just it just it just looked awesome. Yeah, and uh, Matthew Gawkin, you know, the gentleman, he ran a Planescape online game, and I ended up finding I had a character could wear up to medium armor. And I, I ended up finding some padded armor. It was magical. It was a plus one suit of padded armor. It gave me like a plus, I think, 10 to stealth or something that didn't even matter to my character at all. Because I didn't, it's a skill I didn't have. So it like, it let me roll it well enough that I could actually roll that skill now and maybe succeed. Because I didn't have any, I didn't have, it was like, not something that was class correct. But it was padded armor that was magical. And you never find magical padded armor. I was like, oh, hell yeah, we're taking this. And even Matt was like confused, like, huh? Oh. It's like, yes, I'm taking this armor, and, and I was all going through how, you know, I'm wear this armor now. And that was my character's armor. Yeah. Like, I went, I think I lost, like, four or five points to my armor class to put it on. Because plus yeah. one padded armor is, it gives you a bonus of two. And I think I had armor that did, like, plus six or something. I don't remember those details. But I had plus one padded armor, and I was happy as a moment about that. You know, he could have yeah. plus ten plate mail and everything. No, so I got my plus one padded armor, plus ten stealth. I'm good to go. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm about. It's cool. It's different, you know. <laughs> it's better like, to look good than to feel good. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, it makes, you know, and it has other, like, other bonuses, too. I mean, padded armor is a hell of a lot better to wear than, like, some big clunky-ass metal armor. You know, that's going to be, that you know, all sweating and grimy and uncomfortable, heavy. You know, that padded armor is, is definitely definitely going to look good on you. So, you know, for me, you know, that worked out. But, uh, you know, let's wrap it up here. Uh, Alex, you know, any other words you have for the viewing audience out there, for the Barbarian Whore, about the golden rule? <laughs> um, no, but the only thing I have is that uh, I'm, I'm uh, hoping to put together some videos about uh, about some about some of my homebrew rules. Basically, you know, kind of feature some of them so that people can kind of, you know, kind of like we were talking before, so that others who are interested in homebrewing can can <clears throat> Can look at these and, and get some ideas or, or use them, you know, use them as is. I'll see if I can link some files to it so they can actually just you know download them or whatever. So, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Golden Rule and Homebrew. Absolutely, everyone out there in Barbarian Land, I want you to go to Alex's channel. I, I want you to uh, I'll put it right there. Well, I want you to go see Captain Gothnog and subscribe to him, view his videos harass him, send him hate mail, <laughs> whatever you need to do. He's right there on my uh, recommended uh, channels page. You can find him easily, and you can go view his videos. He has some absolutely wonderful content. And there's a reason that he was the first man to be chosen for status 10 characters. Uh, this has been your main man. Alex, thank you for being here. Thank you.